Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of A True Scary Stories here on the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. Today, in honor of the start of the Halloween season, I got over an hour of true creepy stories that happen to people on or around Halloween. This one is a collection of Halloween stories in which we've covered here throughout 2024 and they're compiled into this one episode. If you are joining us for the first time and you enjoy what you hear today, then consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell beside it as I upload some of the best true scary stories you'll hear on YouTube. But with that said, kick back, relax, and let's begin with today's collection of true Halloween stories. So today has been a particularly slow day at work and I've been killing time reading these stories. Maybe enough time has passed and I can share mine. I had this friend who was really into the occult. Unfortunately, I was the one who got him turned on to it. We had a mutual appreciation of the paranormal and all things weird, so I thought the subject would interest him. He started going deep into the subject to the point where he wouldn't talk about anything else. He would actually interrupt a conversation and force the subject back to the occult matters. Rude. But sometimes people go through phases where their interest is all they want to talk about. It was a mostly forgivable offense. I think I should mention that this particular friend didn't have a very large friend circle. His depression and introverted nature kept him inside a lot. He didn't have the best luck in relationships with women either. His world was kind of small, and I did enjoy hanging out with him, so I did my best to be a good friend. I didn't want to just brush him off because he was acting a little weirder than normal. Honestly, for the longest time, he was a totally normal guy. We chat and play video games together on the PlayStation. Sometimes we'd go see movies, with my boyfriend accompanying us. We'd all hung out at the park. We went swimming. Overall, we had a good time hanging out. Things, however, started to go downhill when he started to smoke DMT. Personally, I think psychedelics are amazing tools that can offer insight into your life, but they should be treated with respect. My friend got to the point where he was making it himself. Apparently a pretty easy thing to do after a meager amount of research, and he was smoking it daily, multiple times a day. For those of you who aren't familiar with the substance, when you smoke it, you get transported to a different world, an entirely new plane of existence. Your body and yourself don't exist anymore, you're just exploring this alternate reality dreamscape. My personal experience with it led me to seeing a dragon once in this kaleidoscope of a cornucopia. People see all kinds of different things there. Imagine what that does to a person when they're smoking it 30 plus times a day. He started telling me things like he was the reincarnated Osiris. He said he was seeing Egyptian hieroglyphics all over the place and walking life. Apparently, he had an hour-long conversation with entities in his bedroom even when he wasn't smoking DMT. Of course, I was very alarmed to hear all of this, and I told him he needed to take a serious break. No drugs at all for a few months, so he can find a solid footing in reality again. At this point, I was still hanging out with him, because he obviously needed some help. And like I said before, he didn't have a lot of friends that could actually give him that. He was also the black sheep of the family, so I knew he wasn't getting any kind of support from them. He was really close to his sister, and I did reach out to her on Facebook to express my concerns. I pushed her to talk him into getting some psychiatric help, because he was slipping past the point of no return. I'm not really sure if she took my messages seriously, since we didn't really know each other. Plus, she is at least six years younger than us, and possibly didn't grasp how serious the situation was becoming. In any case, I'll jump forward now to the part where things start to get really creepy. 
My boyfriend made arrangements to hang out with our friend at the park. I didn't really want to go because I felt like I needed a break from him and his nonsensical ranting. I just couldn't deal with it on that particular day. My boyfriend said he wasn't all that bad and we went anyway. We get to the park and he is his usual self, ranting about Egypt and made up gods that only he knew the truth about, etc. He also had this large hunting knife that he kept fiddling with the whole time we were on the walk. He told us that he had began using it in ceremonial magic and that it helped to banish negative thoughts. It made me extremely uneasy. He would do this thing where he would take the knife and make stabbing motions near his heart or head, like he was mock stabbing himself, all while holding a conversation with me or my boyfriend. I think we were both really on edge and didn't know how what to do or what to say about it. I tried to distract him from doing it by bringing up other subjects that might interest him, but he kept on with his ritual. Keep in mind, we were walking on a trail, so it wasn't like we could just say goodbye then and there. We had to walk back to our car and drop him off at his car. My boyfriend had the bright idea that we should get some lunch after our walk, even though I was doing my best to give him a look that said, No way, why do you think I'd want to spend any more time with this nut? But it must not have been very effective, or my boyfriend was ignoring it. Not sure. Either way, we ended up getting in the car to go get lunch. In the car, I was driving. My boyfriend was in the passenger seat, and our weirdo friend was in the back. As we're heading through a busy part of town where all the shopping and restaurants are, I hear the distinctive sound of a belt buckle coming undone. Then, I hear the worst sound imaginable. I peek back out of the corner of my eye, and my suspicions were confirmed. This crazy guy was full on pleasuring himself in our back seat. I mean, pants all the way down, bare ass on the seat, beating it so hard, like it was like he wanted to rip it off. Instantly, I felt sick to my stomach, and all the nervous energy I had throughout the day popped up into my head. I was trying not to shake, and trying to ignore it, and drive through heavy traffic. I kind of had a freeze response, I guess. The whole time, I kept thinking about that huge ass knife he had in his pocket, and obviously he was completely off his rocker now. I was afraid to say anything, or confront him, because I didn't know how he was going to react. This part is nuts. But my boyfriend didn't seem to notice, and the whole time he kept rambling on about god knows what. I couldn't listen because my thoughts were 100% focused on driving and trying to act like I didn't know what was going on in my back seat. We get to the restaurant, and my boyfriend runs inside to grab food. I'm left alone in the car with our friend, and try to act like I'm browsing on my phone, when really, I'm watching and listening as hard as I can. We don't talk. My boyfriend gets back, and I complain that I'm tired, it's been a long day, let's drop him off, etc. So I drive us back to our friend's car, and he doesn't get out of our vehicle, he just sits there. I now have to get a little rude, and ask him to please get out and go home. He gets out of our car and walks over to his passenger side. I start getting really scared, and I suspected the worst. He pulled a gun out of some kind of bag he had on the seat, and he just walks over to our car with it. I don't know why the hell he did this, but I was so pissed, I just got out of my car and walked right up to him. I was maybe three feet away, and I could see it was a loaded 9mm. I kept asking him over and over again, what are you doing? Because apparently that's all my brain could think to do. I told him to get in his car and go home, but he never said anything during this whole time. Just kind of cried and had this wild look in his eye. For whatever reason, he then got back into his car and drove off. I told my boyfriend, obviously we are to never hang out with him again, and that I didn't even want him to talk to him anymore. No contact. Nada. A few months pass, 
and he occasionally messages me through the PlayStation or texts my phone. He says a lot of random stuff, and I just ignore it. It turns out that he moved down to Tennessee near Nashville, but I don't know why. He had a roommate, and I think their girlfriend lived there. I'm not really sure about the situation. I think maybe he's turning his life around and getting a fresh start down there. I think it's best to cut all contact and let him regroup. I'm not interested in any kind of friendship with him, and I know he needed help beyond what I could offer. Again, I reached out to his sister and let her know that he had a gun. She actually managed to get it from him somehow, but it did little good in the end. I get a call around 11pm one night that wakes me up. It's a man claiming he's a detective down in Gallatin, Tennessee, and my heart skips a beat. I start sweating and immediately ask what happened. Apparently, my former friend stabbed someone to death on Halloween day. I don't know all the details, and the articles about it are kind of sparse. The whole thing is really surreal, and I'm just left feeling like I'm lucky that I didn't get shot last summer. This whole thing turned out way longer than I meant it to be, but that's the story. I'm still feeling creeped out by the whole ordeal, and I'm kind of feeling sick after writing all of this out. This happened to me in West Hollywood, Los Angeles in 2015. I just left a Halloween party, and I was dressed as Beetlejuice. An Uber dropped me off at my house, Curzon and Melrose, for anyone familiar with the area, and I started to wander around looking for a food truck. I had seen them around before and didn't really feel nervous walking around as a woman at night by myself. That's because it's not exactly an abandoned area, and it's not exactly known for its crime. I figured I'd find something within a few minutes, and then I'd be on my way home. Plus, I'd only had one or two drinks at this point, nothing to really take my level of alertness down. The problem occurred when I decided to walk between avenues. I wasn't having any luck on Melrose, so I decided to walk north down a residential block. That way I could get to another avenue where I'd have more luck. I remember I really wanted to listen to music, so first mistake, I was looking down at my phone, queuing up a song to play aloud without headphones while I walked. I didn't realize a man was running at me from behind. This was at full speed by the way. That was until he was almost on top of me. Two things happened at once. I realized there was a person literally sprinting at me, and right as I stepped out of the way, he tripped over some fallen palm leaves that weren't visible in the darkness. He stumbled, but didn't fall, and I said something like, Are you okay? But he didn't reply. He just kept running at full speed until he reached the corner and turned left out of my sight. I immediately felt that what had happened was very, very sinister. Looking around, there was no one behind him or in front of him, no friends or someone who dared him to pull some sort of prank, and I got enough of a look at his clothing that he wasn't in running gear at all. Now, even if he had been, why would he be out at 1am, alone, and running at full speed? He legitimately would have slammed into me if I hadn't stepped out of the way at the last second. I can't help but think that something terrible would have happened if I hadn't hurt his feet, or he wouldn't have tripped. What do you guys think? This happened over a decade ago, but I only recently found this subreddit and I think it's a good fit. It was Halloween of 2008. I was in college and still in a relationship with my first serious boyfriend. We had been together since high school, and it took this night to show me our relationship was abusive. It took one more incident before I finally left him for good. It was wonderful when sober, if intense, and controlling. But when he was drunk, I learned he was truly terrifying. This was the first such incident that truly scared me. He joined in a stupid game of a Gatorade and Shine Challenge. They'd empty a bottle of Gatorade at least halfway, 
and fill the rest up with moonshine. The goal was to finish the bottle within an hour and then tell them crazy stories. While he completed the challenge, but he never did tell his friends the story, he couldn't remember most of it, and it painted him in a horrific light. I knew things were heading downhill when he started calling me a slut after saying hi to a guy friend at the party we were at. I decided we'd better head home before he got any worse. I thought I could nip it in the bud, manage it, you know? Well, we get home and change out of our costumes. James wanted to have sex, but in his state and after what he called me, I wasn't interested. Oddly enough, it led him to calling me a whore. I left the apartment to go smoke after that. Our neighbors were having a party, and two guys were outside smoking as well. They came over to see if I was okay. I'd been crying, and they'd heard the yelling. I said I was, which they could obviously see was a lie. They let me know if I needed help, well, they could help me. James chose that moment to come outside. He said he'd heard us, and told them to get away from me, stalking towards them in the process. I stood up to get between them. They told me they'd meant what they had said and not to forget it. Then they told him to watch himself. I was facing them to say bye and thanks for the offer. And that's when one of the guys gasped. They were staring at my boyfriend in shock. So I turned around and my eyes immediately caught on the ground. Just as what I was seeing registered, the other guy lunged forward and grabbed me pulling me behind him. Now, what was on the ground that had triggered such reactions, you ask? Blood. Blood was dripping on the ground from his hand. He was holding a knife so tightly that he had sliced his own hand open. I begged him to drop it, which he only agreed to when I walked back towards him. I was an idiot, I know. The two guys seemed at a loss, and I feel so bad for them having their Halloween ruined by this crazy, scary bullshit. They left me to it after I swore I'd be fine, reiterating that I could come to them for help. We got inside, and I immediately started hiding all the sharp objects. I called James's roommate, begging them to come home. He started screaming to give him the knives back. How I was a slut, and if I wouldn't even sleep with him. What use was I? So I called my parents, and I ended up leaving. Then I called his mom because I was scared he'd hurt himself. Well, it turns out that she told me that he was my problem now. I should have called the police, but I didn't want to ruin his life. I know, I know. I'm ashamed to say I got back together with him for six more months of hell after that. But today I can safely say, James... Please, let's not meet ever again. This is my first time posting anything here, but I feel like I have an interesting story to share. I've always wanted to turn it into a book or something, but I've been super busy with school. To start out, this story sort of takes place on and off again throughout most of my life. It starts out as a typical, my parents got a divorce when I was young situation, but it unfolded into so much more. In fact, I'm still picking up pieces of everything that happened. Just a warning, this is a super long story. I don't blame you if you lose interest halfway in. There is a lot of backstory that I do feel is important to understanding what happened. As it stands now, my father is dead. It was ruled a suicide, but I think that was only half of what happened. I'll talk about everything that led up to this, but more importantly, I believe that Mary definitely had a hand in what happened. Anyway, my mother and father divorced when I was around four years old. Almost everyone I know has gone through some sort of similar situation. I have two brothers. One older and one younger. We saw him about every other weekend. He paid child support. You get the gist. One weekend visit, my father introduces us to a woman he's seeing, named Mary. Her eyes and hair are dark, 
and her skin is pale. She had an obsession with the color red. Something was immediately off to me, but I didn't really start to know what she was capable of until later. I don't know it at the time, but Mary is one of the main reasons my parents got divorced. My father cheated on my mother with her. He met her while he was working as a waiter at a Red Lobster. When he moved over to his career at a casino as a slot machine repairman, she followed. Mary would follow my dad everywhere. They got married pretty quickly after my mother and father divorced. I never even knew there was a wedding until later. My mother hated her, but she never badmouthed my father or Mary in front of my brothers and I. She felt that it was important for us to make judgments for ourselves, even if this woman was part of the reason her marriage was broken up. We continued to visit what was now Dad and Mary's house on our scheduled time with Dad. I always associated their house with red. Their house was always decorated with strawberries. Mary liked red sheets. She had red sweaters and pants. It was weird. Mary was just unnecessary drama for a while. Things like buying us toys that we could only keep at Dad and Mary's house, or saying that she and my father wanted custody of us instead of my mom. I felt like these things were harmless in a way. Every divorcing couple probably has some sort of variation. Things carried on like this for a couple of years. We would have a special variation of Christmas or Easter or whatever aside from what we celebrated with my mother. I was about 8 years old when I remember the first incident that confirmed that I knew that this wasn't right. My little brother was a super curious child, and he was about four years old. He had scooted a dining table chair to the fridge to get a cereal box on top, and when he reached up, he pulled out a handgun instead of the cereal box. I panicked and got my dad, who acted really funny about it. My memory is fuzzy, but I remember going home early that weekend. My dad didn't know the gun was there because it was Mary's. It was at this point that my mom started to have trouble with us going over there. My father got worse about being able to come pick us up. He was unreliable for the most part to begin with, but I know that he was ten times worse when he was around Mary. My mom told me later, when I was much older, that Mary called our house around the time of the gun incident and said, I want your life. My mother is a really tough lady. She grew up in East LA in California. This scared her. She was going to get a restraining order soon. I guess what Mary meant was that she wanted my mom's stability. Even as a single mom with three kids, she was doing very well for herself and even dating too. But even so, how long? as she obsessed with my mom before she and my father ever got divorced. What did that even mean? Not long after the phone call, my mom heard her car being smashed into one evening. Someone had taken a brick and smashed the driver window. Nothing was taken. I know it was Mary. We had no way to prove it of course, but I just know. My dad and Mary had a baby. Her name is Madison. I only remember holding slash playing with her for so long. I can't imagine all the stuff that she's been through. My mom met and married my stepdad pretty soon after that, and they decided that it would be best to move to Florida. We had other family there, and there weren't many jobs where we were living in Tennessee. I don't remember any problems at all when we were so far from Dad and Mary. We stayed for about a year, and then we moved back to Tennessee. My stepdad was able to get a better job again, and we were closer to my mom's parents. This is when the phone calls start. As soon as we moved back, we would get phone calls where someone would just listen for a few minutes 
and then hang up. The numbers were always blocked, but I'm sure it was her. She always knew where we lived because we started seeing my dad again. The calls continued for years. It actually became a sort of like an inside joke. We all knew who it was, but there wasn't anything that we could do. My father denied it, and any time I asked him about it, he took her side. We fell into this thing where my mom was the bad guy, and any time I questioned my dad and Mary's behavior, they were sure my mom was putting me up to it. Things escalated one evening when my dad came back to pick us up for a visit. My mom and Mary ended up getting into a fist fight where Mary swung first, and my mom punched her so hard that she fell backwards. My brothers and I watched from the apartment we were living in at the time. Mom went immediately to the police, but my dad and Mary never even called. My mom didn't press any charges, and the whole incident sort of faded away. We ended up moving into a big house a while after that, where we still are today. Dad and Mary started to have problems, and they split up. I thought maybe she would be gone for good, or at least gone for the most part, but she never really went away. My dad started to become a person that we could somewhat rely on again when she was gone. I got to know my little sister more, the baby they had, and things were okay. She started coming around again though. Whenever she was with my dad in front of us, she would whisper in his ear. My dad would drink more. He became physically ill looking and would start to gain weight. We could always tell when Mary was around because the difference was so drastic. He even officially divorced her at one point, but it was obvious that they still got together on and off. My brothers and I went on with our lives, and we became too old for visiting the way we were. All weekend visits became just going to see my dad for an evening. The whole time, however, the phone calls never stopped. They weren't as frequent, mind you, but they were there in the background, like a reminder that she was still lurking there. When I got into high school, visits from my dad just about stopped altogether. We usually talked on the phone here and there, and I saw him when I had events, like a marching band competition, a formal dance, milestones like graduating high school. It was pretty common to go a while without hearing from him sometimes. Mary was only a thought. I hadn't seen her in years. I never saw her anywhere at all. The phone calls had stopped, but only because we had gotten rid of the house phone. I was now a freshman in college, and I remember it being right around Halloween of 2009. I was shopping with my aunt for some cheap decorations at the Walmart by my house. I saw a woman walking slowly behind us, and aunt and I both did a double take. It was Mary. She was totally following us around the store. She looked like she was maybe 50 years older than when I last saw her, and her clothing was disheveled as well. My aunt kept elbowing me to go talk to her because we weren't exactly sure if this really was her. I mean, it could have just been someone who looked really similar to her. I worked up the nerve and went up to her. Is your name Mary? I asked. Yes, it is. Hi, Samantha. How are you? Using my name like that really caught me off guard. She knew who I was and wasn't bothering to talk to me. She didn't even act like she was being caught either. I asked her if she had talked to my dad lately, because it had been a while since I heard from him. She swore up and down that she hadn't spoken to him for months, which I later found out was a lie. This was the beginning of my dad going missing. After I saw her, something happened, and it's hard to pin down what but he completely disappeared. His cell phone was shut off, and when I called his work at the casino where he had been working for over 15 years, they said that he was no longer working there and couldn't tell me why. 
My mom and brothers and I called the police to file a missing persons report. We didn't have to wait because it had already been several weeks since we had heard from him. They helped us make a flyer and we looked and asked all over. Everything led back to Mary, most likely being the one to have last seen him. By the time we started talking to her, it was mid-November. My mother and I called Mary, and she told us that she had, in fact, seen my dad on the night after Halloween. Mary told us that he was making a noose, and this would be the last time anyone ever saw him. We honestly didn't know what to believe. My dad was an alcoholic. It wasn't uncommon for him to say dramatic stuff, but we never considered suicide. When we told the detectives what Mary told us, they had her come in for questioning. She had told the detectives a completely different story, and her dates kept changing. There wasn't any evidence of anything though, so there wasn't much that they could do. The detectives did, however, tell us they we shouldn't talk to her anymore. To quote them, we don't know what she's capable of. Things went on like this until they found him on January 4th, 2010. My dad was found dead in his storage unit. He had pulled his car in, shut the unit door, and let it run until he died, and he had been there for 63 days. There were several notes all dated for November 2nd, one for my mom, one for each of his children, but there was an especially long note for Mary, where he dotted on her and talked about what a wonderful woman she was. The note even said for her to take any insurance money and use it on herself. The date on the notes was so close to the date where Mary said she had seen him. There are a million things that could have happened, but I know that she had something to do with it. Even if my father really did kill himself, I know that she helped push him over the edge. I'm not one to just blame someone. I know my father was a troubled man. He was an alcoholic, and he was depressed most of the time, usually because of Mary. But there's something so frustrating and horrendous about this woman, and there's zero evidence for me to prove anything against her. She wasn't allowed to come to the funeral, though. My mom and parts of his family put everything together. There wasn't anyone he knew that hadn't heard of her, and everyone felt that she was a bad woman. I found a Facebook profile of hers months after they found my dad. There were only five or six photos of her, and also some guy obviously happy, and they were all dated for January 4th, 2010. The next year, on January 4th, 2011, she showed up at my family's house. We didn't let her in the house, and she kept saying something about having some stuff on my dad's in the car. We told her to leave or else we would call the police. That night, someone put red tissue paper in and around our mailbox. Even the next year, 2012, she called my mom and asked her to meet her in his Sonic Burger parking lot. She said she had a box of my dad's stuff to give us. My mom made my stepdad go instead of her, but she never showed up. I feel like she wanted to do something bad to my mother. The following year, we didn't hear from her. I did some research, and it turns out that she was put in jail for making meth. It made a lot of sense for some of the things, but I still have so many questions and issues that are unanswered. Supposedly, she was let out sometime last year, summer of 2014 I think. The correctional facility that she was at has a website, and it says that she was let out for good behavior and rehab as well. I found a different Facebook that showed her with some other family. God help them if she's pulling the same crap as she did with mine. Today, I have no idea where she is, and until I can move far away, I don't want to see Mary ever again. Update 8515 I just wanted to update this while it's still fresh in my mind. My little brother received a visit from Scary Mary in person. 
My little brother works at a video game store. It was around 8 p.m. last night, 8, 4, 15, and Madison, Mary's daughter, came in to buy a video game. My little brother was shocked, and he didn't recognize her. She introduced herself, and my little brother couldn't do much. She asked for his phone number, but my brother didn't end up giving it to her because he had a weird feeling in his stomach. She took what she bought and left, and my little brother thought that was the end of it. But maybe five to ten minutes later, in walks Madison again, with Mary by her side. My little brother immediately recognized her and started to panic. Mary and Madison stood at the back of the store, whispering to each other. He said that they were both smiling the whole time, and a couple of times, they giggled to each other. Mary then looked him right in the eyes, and started to head towards the counter my brother was behind. He said that he felt so angry, and his heart started to race. Instead of trying to confront her, he walked into the back of the store, and let his co-worker ask if he could help her. Maybe ten minutes later, she was now gone, and his co-worker told him that she left without asking for anything. My brother thinks that she was just making her presence known, and that she thought she could catch up with them like they were friends or something. I just know that I don't want this woman in my life anymore. I don't want her harassing my family members and I want to move as far away as possible. We documented this incident with the police department, and they said that if it happens three times, then we can file a restraining order. I don't really know what else to do. Anyway, I just thought this might be something you guys are interested in hearing. As much as I thought it finally might be over, she pops right back up again. It's not enough for her that my dad is dead. I guess she wants to have the last word. She always wanted to have the upper hand. But yeah, I'll keep everyone updated if I find out even more. My parents divorced when I was around 4 to 5 years old, during and after the divorce. My brother, who we're going to call Chris, my mom and I, ended up moving into a two-bedroom apartment townhouse. Now, this is not the nice townhouse that you might imagine. It wasn't complete shithole, per se, but they were older, built in the 60s, this is 1990s, and in a rougher part of town, something a single mother with two kids could swing. The layout of the apartment is important to the story, so do bear with me for a moment. When you walk in the front door, the kitchen is immediately to your left, and there's a short entrance hallway in front of you. The kitchen has an open countertop area that looks into a dining spot for a table, and a split-level living room slash den area that also had glass sliding doors leading to the backyard. No fence for privacy, by the way, and there was a rather sad and sparse playground. In the hallway entrance again on the right is a staircase leading up to my mom's and mine and my brother's rooms. One day after school, my brother and I are out playing in the backyard on the playground, doing our typical kid stuff, and that's when my mom told us she wanted to go check the mail. The mailboxes of the apartments are located at the front entrance, which is on the opposite side of the complex from us. Naturally, me being five and Chris being nine, my mom didn't want to leave us alone, especially since it was about to get dark outside. We came inside and we got ready to leave. On the way out, I remember my mom asking Chris if he had closed and locked the sliding glass door. Chris said he had. Now cut to when we're back from the mailroom. It's maybe been about 20 to 30 minutes max. It's hard to recall fully, but my mom unlocks the apartment door. I'm lingering in the car for some reason or another. Chris doesn't notice I'm not in the apartment yet, and on the stairs leading to the bedrooms on the right, he sees someone's feet disappear at the top of the landing, as if somebody were running to hide. Thinking they're meme, he doesn't really think something's off. 
Chris goes to the kitchen, and I actually go upstairs directly into our bedroom to get ready for the bed slash bath in the bathroom. My mom is at the table in the dining area near the split level living area which is downstairs. While I'm completely clueless, getting ready for bed in the bathroom, Chris from downstairs keeps hearing someone walking around in my mom's bedroom. Now, I had a bad habit when I was this age of going through people's stuff. Not maliciously, I was barely five, just curiosity or whatever, and Chris thinking I'm being a nosy bastard going through all of our mom's jewelry, etc., runs upstairs to catch me in the act and get me in trouble. Chris runs up the stairs, and then sprints across the hall to my mom's bedroom and throws himself stomach first on the bed. When he looks up, he sees a tall slender man with a bright green goblin latex Halloween mask on, and he's holding a large knife he has swiped from the kitchen. My brother sits silently in shock as the man in the goblin mask raises one finger to the mouth, which indicated for him to be quiet, and in true form for my brother, he screamed a bloody murder for our mom. Now, I've heard things going on, but I have no idea and I'm not aware of what's happening. I have gotten into my big oversized sleep shirt and I'm going downstairs to have a glass of milk before bed. When Chris screamed, the man ran downstairs and encountered my mom who immediately jumped into action. Our baseball gear was in the living room and my mom grabbed a baseball bat and started fighting this man in our house while he's taking swipes at her with a knife. I first notice what's happening when I've come downstairs to the kitchen, pulled up a step stool to reach the counter and to pour a glass of milk. And that's when I see over the bar, the guy pushed my mom off the steps into the split level living room, landing on her back. She starts swinging the bat wildly, trying to make any contact with it, and she does. I'm glued to this image truly frozen in place. Not scared, just so young that you can't fully process what you're seeing. The man finally runs towards the front door, which is right by the kitchen. I mid-pour my glass of milk, frozen, milk continuing to spill out over the counter and the floor. He stops and turns directly to me, and in that green goblin mask with a knife, screams a primal, deep sound of rage and frustration and then slams the door so hard, the whole place shakes. I continue to standing on my stool, pouring milk everywhere, frozen for... I don't really know, but could have been a second, but it felt so long. I don't remember what happened after that, but all the parts I've relayed are very clear to me. The moral of this story. Lock your doors. And don't just assume you did. And dear man in the goblin mask, let's not meet again. My husband Jim and I own an antique business in a big old bizarre barn of a building. Five floors, multiple other tenants, including a restaurant as well. Halloween was a Monday last year. We locked up the business at 5 p.m. and we went to an early dinner across town. Then we got a call from Sonatrol our security monitoring company at 6.30. A motion detected on the lower level. Then another. We left in a tearing hurry, but figured it's a bird or a rat. We don't have rats though, but you know, something may be a cat. It was way too early for a break-in after all. I went inside the main level upstairs and disarmed the alarm and started fumbling noisily with the keys and the big iron gate, one of many that separate the floors at night. Jim checked the perimeter outside for signs of a break-in. Nothing. Doors and windows were intact. Definitely, absolutely a bird or a rat or a cat. Dusk was long gone. The shadows had settled in and taken over. Just as wardrobes loomed in the dark. Wardrobes, and nothing more, right? I headed down below to the location of the alarm, trusting Jim would follow after all. It was a rat, or a cat, or a bird. I am accustomed to the building after dark, so I just turned on my phone light, not the overheads, and walked around boldly like I owned the place. 
I looked at the corner with the motion detector. Nothing. Just its red eye blinking mindlessly at me. No rats. No cats. No birds. I turned and went the other way while Jim poked around a few aisles over. And there it was. A burglary kit sitting in the middle of the floor. Bolt cutters. A fire extinguisher. Just sitting there. Waiting. I have never gotten a larger case of sheer terror so fast. After all, there was no broken window or door. So, that meant he was still there in the dark with me. I hissed, Jim, 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 please. And he didn't hear me. I literally couldn't scream, just like in those stupid god dang dreams. My voice stuck. Just me, the spot with the burglar tools and a hostile presence lurking in the dusty shadows, watching while I whispered for someone to save me. Finally, a thousand years, or maybe ten seconds later, Jim wondered why I'd taken root in the hallway and came to see me. He saw what I was frozen pointing at and was like, oh shit. We bolted out the front door to call 911 and wait, and we abandoned the building to the burglar. An eternal five minutes later, the police showed up and were initially pretty unimpressed with our find of the crowbar, as well as fire extinguisher. That's until we pulled up the security footage that revealed the actual horror, the face of my new sleep paralysis demon. This guy, as is obvious, he is built like a lean, mean, brick shithouse. He'd crouched on a landing behind a bookcase when we closed, and watched me and my staff lock up, bided his time. Then, calm as he could, he walked out and went to the men's restroom in the hallway downstairs. That area isn't set for motion detect for a variety of reasons. He spent a while in there moving around with the door open. He constructed the mask using one of ours and a fake flower wreath to hold it on. Purple plastic clematis. He looked right into the camera barefaced and then put the mask on, stared at it fixedly in his mask for a time, and finally pulled his gloves on. He stacked a few solid body vintage suitcases in front of a tall iron gate and hopped right over it like it was nothing. He ran down the hall, triggering the 6.30 silent alarm and looped the floor. He ran back into the hall and moved a ladder to hop back to the other side of the gate and, bizarrely, just repeated this whole thing a few times. Then he went to the basement wormed over a 15 inch gap over yet another iron gate. He went back to the hall again, stared into the camera more, repeat. He was moving fast up and over, back and forth, upstairs and downstairs, parkour style almost. Then he got the tools out and peeled apart one of our steel lock boxes with the crowbar and stole a handful of our keys to access showcases. At this point, he heard me fumbling with the gate and keys upstairs. He ditched the stolen keys and tools and hid, watching me while he waited in the dark. We exited to call 911 and he ran back to the basement. In the basement, there is access to a dirt tunnel that circles the perimeter of the building. He broke the door open and entered. Spiders the size of dinner plates live in there. He had no light. It's muddy and dank. It's, in a word, petrifying. There is a tiny exit hatch if you walk the whole thing and take the multiple turns that dumps you into the busy kitchen of a restaurant whereupon one would need to stroll past the line cooks out into the restaurant proper with cameras and then one could leave their front door plastered with mud which does leave tracks. Speaking from experience, when we found it, 
there was as clear entrance into the tunnel, but no exit tracks, no muddy footprints, nobody walking out onto the restaurant cameras, and the cooks noticed nothing. It was a busy night though. Reviewing the footage, timing it all, tracing its path from camera to camera, and searching the building carefully took hours. By the end, all of us, including the police, were starting to lose our collective cool and freak out. There was no chill when even the guys with guns were rattled. After if all, he's dead, where the hell there? did he go? Jim and the two officers had no choice but to walk the dirt tunnel. The cops took one look and were like, absolutely not. Jim insisted, and so they made him walk point. They made it about half the tunnel before the cops were like, hell no, you are leaving with us, and we're gonna review more footage from the restaurant where there are no spiders, and screw this. Jim got the okay from them to board up both ends of the tunnels, which he did solidly. And thus, the story ends. The pictures got spread wildly, but we got no useful leads, despite the decent face shot. Did he indeed crawl out a hatch in the busy kitchen and stroll out past the cooks, leaving no trace of mud? I guess. We got no suspicious smells coming out of the tunnel in later weeks and months, but nobody has walked that far side since. We only onboarded the tunnel last week for the split water main shenanigans. I have vowed I will use his skull in this year's Halloween display. In the spirit of Halloween, I will share an incident that happened to me last October. It was 10 a.m. on a weekday, and I had the day off, so I decided to go to the grocery store and get some pumpkins to carve. I did my shopping with no issues. I didn't notice anything off since it was earlier in the daytime, and the other shoppers were elderly. I bought three large pumpkins, and I had them in a cart to put in the trunk of my car. As I was putting the first pumpkin in my trunk, holding it with one arm, opening the trunk with the other, and my back to the parking lot. I feel someone pulling the pumpkin out of my arm backwards. I spun around and I threw that pumpkin in the process and I see two men directly behind me. I'm a very small female, so I immediately felt endangered. The one man, who I assumed was the man who first grabbed at me, made an attempt to scream at me in a language I didn't understand and grab at me again. I pushed the cart with the remaining pumpkins at the two men, and I got in my car to lock the doors and drive away. The two men got into a white, brand new Dodge Charger with temporary plates, and they sped out of the parking lot after me. The street we both pulled out on was a busy, four-lane, 25-mile-an-hour business district. You can't safely speed. But that didn't matter to the Dodge Charger, who weaved in and out of traffic to try and run me off the road. The driving was so erratic that another driver attempted to box the Charger in, but it didn't matter much. They went into incoming traffic anyway. Meanwhile, I threw my left turn signal on, and I made a quick ride into a coffee and donut chain I regularly frequented. Next to this coffee chain is a pizza chain. It's not yet open. I noticed that the charger had pulled into this pizza chain and was waiting for me to pull out of the coffee chain parking lot. I frantically told the employee what was going on through the drive through Meanwhile, I ordered a snack. I mean, I was there and I didn't want to pull out yet. This coffee chain knows me well, and on this day, the manager went above and beyond the call of duty. She called the police who told her to have me pull around to the window. She did, knowing I would be in full view of the charger, so she came outside to stand between us with the biggest rolling pin I've ever seen in my life. She stared those men down like my own mother would have. The cops arrived, and they took statements. The charger was still there and searched. One officer told me they pulled tarp and rope from the trunk and are treating this as a trafficking attempt. Both men refused to answer any questions and ended up getting arrested. 
I don't know for sure what their intent was, but I live in a sanctuary city with mostly people from Nepal or Bhutan, and I've never had a scary issue. I love my neighborhood, but I did not recognize these men or their car frequenting the neighborhood. That day, I bought everyone working at that coffee chain a gift certificate for a massage as a thank you for protecting me, and I still tip them every morning extra a year later. So pumpkin grabbing dudes in a white Dodge Charger. Let's not meet. This happened when I was either 10 or 11. It was Halloween night, and to make things even better, this year it fell on a Friday. I was trick-or-treating with a friend of mine, who I'll just call Jane, and both her and my mom. Jane was dressed as a birthday present, and I was Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. It was around 9pm, and Jane and I had collected a mountain of candy. It was to the point where our arms were beginning to hurt from carrying the bags. During our trek, we came to a hill in our neighborhood where there aren't any houses, until of course you get to the top. I was determined to increase my candy intake as fast as possible, so I sprinted to the top of the hill, leaving Jane and our parents behind. When I got to the top, I heard my mom yell for me to wait for them. I was impatient, but I still did as I was told. About that time, a black car pulled up next to me. I can't remember what type of car it was, but I think it was either a Volvo or a Honda Civic. A guy who looked like he was in his late 20s to early 30s rolled down the window and said hello to me. He looked the really friendly type, so I happily said hello back. He asked me, have you gotten a lot of candy tonight? I responded, yep, and happily showed off my nearly overflowing bag. He smiled. That's awesome. Can you come here and give me some candy? That's when I froze. My parents were the kind of people who drilled the stranger danger warnings into your head, and this guy may not have looked like a creeper, but all the signs seemed to be there. Even my 10 to 11 year old self could see that. At that point, I really had no idea what to do. I guess the guy saw my face, because he motioned for me to come. I just want a little candy. You don't have to give me your whole bag, he said. I noticed somebody in the passenger side of the car lean forward to look at me too, and both had creepy smiles on their faces. I contemplated whether or not I should run. But luckily about that time, my mother came running up the hill, having seen what was going on. The guy saw her too, and his face turned white. I gotta go, he said, staring at my mom the whole time and floor the car down the road. My mom ran to me, and I threw my arms around her, starting to cry. When Jane and her mom finally caught up, we all ended up walking back to my house. I was clinging to my mom's arm the whole time. My bag of candy was eventually able to take my mind off of the situation, but I occasionally look back on this nowadays, and I can't help but wonder what could have happened to me if I had gone up to that guy's car. I thank God that I was smart enough not to do so. So creepy Halloween guy, let's not meet again. This happened to me when I was 7 or 8 years old, so the details are a bit fuzzy. My sister reminded me of this memory this past Halloween when we were taking our kids out for trick or treating. When I was 7 to 8, like over 20 years ago, my sister, who is nine years older than me by the way, took me trick-or-treating since my parents were both working, both worked at a hospital. My costume was a generic superhero costume, where the mask can come on and off easily. We were walking for a while, and my sister was letting me walk up to the homes by myself as she watched me from the sidewalk. We came to this house, and an old man opens the door. He was about to give me the fun size candy bar, and then said, Wait, come inside and I'll give you the full size candy bar. Me being a dumb kid and only hearing a full size candy bar went inside. 
Lo and behold, there is a box of full-size Snickers bars like the ones you get from Costco. I was given a Snickers bar and I was about to leave when he said that he had more candy in the kitchen. That's when my sister showed up and said we needed to leave. Of course, I left upset because I was dumb and I wanted more candy. She was upset because I went into a stranger's house and ended our trick-or-treating right then and there. Let's just say I wasn't allowed a piece of candy that night. A few days later, while my sister was watching the television, she screams, Mom, Dad, that's the guy from Halloween. Apparently, the old man that lured me into his house was arrested for luring kids into his home when he wasn't supposed to, since he was on the child as sex offender registry. I'm so thankful that my sister was there, and luckily nothing happened. To the old man that tried to lure me in further into his home, let's not meet. I had just started my first year of college, and it was the Saturday before Halloween. I was assigned to temporary housing because of the overflow of incoming freshmen. So for the first few months, I was living in the fraternity dorm. Everyone in the frat went to an off-campus to party, and by 10pm, I was the last one left in the dorm. At first, I was relieved. I was ready for a quiet night with some popcorn and a scary movies. With snacks in hand, I pressed play and went on with my night. Around midnight, nearing the end of the first movie, I heard the stairwell door slam. I got up and looked out the peephole, but I saw nothing. I climbed it back on my bed. Moments later, I heard three loud thuds on my door. I paused the movie and I went to check it out. I figured my roommate was drunk and locked out. I checked the peephole again, and I saw a man in a black hoodie standing with his back to the door. It was not my roommate. I double checked on the lock, and I went back to my business, but that's when the banging started again. However, this time it was louder. I grabbed my roommate's baseball bat and I yelled, Who's there? Yes, I'm aware of the horror movie rules. But sometimes you don't think of those things. The banging stopped once they heard my voice. I then heard footsteps as they walked away. I approached and I placed my ear on the door, listening for any sounds out in the silent hallway. But it was quiet. I looked out the peephole and it was dark. I leaned back in confusion and I looked out again. Right then, the man's hand moved out of the way of the peephole and swung a bat at the door. I fell back in shock, and I scrambled for my phone. Immediately, I called the campus security. The man on the other end of the line could hear the banging and sent an officer right away. The banging stopped, and I heard the stairwell door slam again. I sat with my back against the wall, watching the door for what seemed like hours. About 15 minutes later, there's more banging on the door. I jumped out of my daze as the officer yells through the door to open up. I let them in and I tell them the whole story. He said security had searched the whole building and the area around it as well and saw nobody who matched the description. Nobody was ever caught. A week later, an opening became available in another dorm and I was able to transfer shortly after this incident. So that was the last story for today's episode. If this was the first time you joined us, then do consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of all the future uploads coming here to the channel. Also, make sure to leave a like rating if you enjoyed it, and leave a comment telling me what you all thought. Also, if you yourself have a scary story that you'd like to share, then send it in with my user submissions email, which appears on screen on my videos tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now, if you're looking for more of the Creepy Fox, then check out all the other videos I got on my channel. There's so much narration content that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I've also got some exclusive Scary Stories narration episodes. If you'd like to listen to those, then for as little as $2 a month, you can become a Creepy Fox channel member and gain access to 10 plus hours of extra additional content. 
I also got some cool merch which is featured down below. There's shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it. I got a lot of things that you might like, so check it out, see if you might find something on the Creepy Fox shop. Lastly, it's not something I really talk about or mention, but I wanted to go ahead and plug my other social media. If you wanted to follow me on my Instagram, I'm pretty active there. It's at the Creepy Fox official. But you can see the name on the bottom right of all my videos. I like to post videos of my pets, specifically my dog and my birds, so if you're somebody that likes animals, then give me a follow and check out my stories. I'm always posting daily. Anyway, that is gonna go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much everyone for watching today, and I'll go ahead and catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.